Hello everyone and welcome back to Mossy Bottom. This is the second video in my three-part series all about permaculture, which I've been practicing on my small holding here in the west of Ireland for six years. It's now the beginning of July and I want to take you on a tour of my garden. I want to show you what I'm growing, how it's doing, but more crucially, I want to use this opportunity to share with you the 12 principles of permaculture and provide you with examples of how I've implemented each, sometimes without even knowing it, in the design and management of my garden. If you're unfamiliar with permaculture or why anyone would want to practice it, then go back and watch video one in this series, because in it I tackle that very question. Okay, let's get started. Principle one, observe and interact. In the previous video, I defined permaculture in three ways copying nature, connecting dots, and sustainable agriculture. But to copy nature, you first have to understand it, and not just in a broad sense, but as it pertains to your piece of land. What are the ecosystems there? The birds, invertebrates, mammals, the trees, shrubs, annuals and ephemerals. What are their needs? How do they interact with each other? And even more importantly, how do you interact with them? Because remember, permaculture is about providing people with food in a sustainable way, not just leaving nature to get on with it. To understand, you have to observe, which is why just about every book you'll read on permaculture design will first tell you to live with the land for at least two years before making any drastic changes. That will give you time to become familiar with the local climate. Where are the frost pockets? What's the prevailing wind direction? The areas that flood in the winter or dry out conversely in the summer? What months of the year does the ground freeze and how deep? What species of wild plant already thrive in each area? And what might you replace them with that would provide food for you while filling that same ecological niche? To connect those dots and create sustainable agriculture, Based on the natural world, you first have to become part of it and be willing to learn from it. Observation and interaction rather than domination through brute force. So resist felling trees and hiring diggers until you really understand the land. Of course, that means doing things slowly, which most of us have forgotten how to do in the 21st century. I think doing things slowly is a skill that should be taught at schools because if you do embrace a slower pace as I try to, believe me, it makes every small victory from digging up your first potato to harvesting your first peach, this is the year folks, that much more satisfying. My example of observe and interact is pathways like the ones right beneath me. It took me five years to put gravel down here and when I finally did, it was where the land told me they should be, not where my design had imagined them. The result, I think, is beautiful and it's efficient, just like nature. Principle two, catch and store energy. And when you hear that, you probably think solar panels and battery banks, which I do have. But remember, nature itself is catching and storing energy in a far more sophisticated way than solar panels ever can. In a natural ecosystem, every single niche from the canopy of a forest to the shrubs, annuals and ephemerals that sprout forth beneath it is being utilised. And that's what this principle is really about, making the most of such an incredible resource, when it comes out, that is. How do you do that? Well, by growing plants, of course, and creating interdependencies between those plants which benefit each other and recycle that energy as much as you can. Think of sunlight as money pouring out of the sky in the form of solar radiation. And plants, in all their many forms, as a giant net capturing that money. The more plants and the more niches you fill with different plants, i.e. biodiversity, the more money you hold on to. And think of those interdependencies as a way of stopping that money being lost to inflation. For instance, if you can compost plant waste that creates nutrient-rich soil and through that a way to grow bigger plants the following year, then you've just held on to a bigger wad of cash. It's a bizarre analogy, but I think it works. 
Sunlight is all we need to thrive, and monoculture farming, well, it wastes most of it. Permaculture, just like nature, tries not to. And my personal example of catch and store energy isn't my solar panels or battery bank, it's these trees, more specifically, coppiced elder trees. By allowing these trees to grow as a border hedge, I'm creating a windbreak for my crops which are just in front of me. As well as protecting those crops from storms, these trees yield a huge harvest of elderflowers and elderberries, which are just coming in now. And I eat them, as do my livestock, as do local birds and pollinators, which support my crops. By coppicing, I keep that crop low so that I can harvest it easily. And I take the sunlight, which has been turned into carbon in the form of the branches, and I turn that into fuel to heat my home during the winter. And I turn it into wood chips to enrich my compost, which then enriches the soil without needing external inputs like fertilizer. And again, gives me a bigger vegetable crop the following year. Do you see how those dots are being connected just as they are in nature? Principle three, obtain a yield. And to me, this is obvious, because when you read about permaculture, you quickly realize that that's the point, obtaining a bigger yield. But I think in recent decades, the word permaculture has become associated uh, with venerating nature and embracing an almost paganistic sense of natural chaos. But permaculture is not chaotic. It's organized and systematic. It demands an almost scientific knowledge of ecosystems in order that you can use plants and animals, both domesticated animals in the form of livestock and wild animals like birds and pollinators to benefit each other. And through that, to benefit you. That's the point. If you go into an ancient woodland, and sadly here, there aren't many left where I live, but the few that I have walked through in my life are magical places which fill my heart with joy, there's no doubt about it. And they're definitely worthy of the deepest veneration. But quite honestly, they aren't overflowing with food that people can eat. Yes, there's plenty of wild edibles, but they tend to be low calorie, leafy greens most of the year that you might add to a meal rather than the starchy staples like uh, potatoes, nuts, rice, that form the bulk of a meal. So to obtain a yield, you can't simply allow nature to do its own thing. You have to copy it in a way that is highly productive for people. That's permaculture. My example of obtain a yield, the trees that I've planted at Mossy Bottom, they're all food producing. Cherry, pear, apple like this, mirabelle, uh, plum, cobnut, filbert, and several others. Most of them are still too young to produce huge harvests, but that will come. This tree behind me, it's only about three years old, but there are already apples growing on it, which is great. Principle four, apply self-regulation and feedback. One of the things that I say all the time on this channel is give yourself permission to make mistakes. But unfortunately, we live in a world in which you're not really supposed to do anything unless you're an expert at it and have qualifications in it. Doing something wrong, understanding what went wrong through observation, correcting that mistake and then doing it right, is, I think, one of the most meaningful things you can do in life. And permaculture allows you to embrace that philosophy. You don't have to be an expert to get started. And I've made so many mistakes here over the last six years. In the first year, I cut down an ash tree, which I thought was casting shade on my cottage. But that same winter, every tree near it was blown down in a storm, many of which I wanted to keep. I now realize that that ash tree was acting as a windbreak, protecting those around it. And on the subject of windbreaks, we have my example for apply self-regulation and feedback. This, behind me, is my food forest. And food forests are what people typically associate with permaculture. Do a few searches on YouTube and you'll find lots of videos showing food forests like this that are much more mature. In truth, this is only one aspect of permaculture design. My food forest is only about three and a half years old, so it's not yet mature. But it does already produce a huge crop, particularly of soft fruits, gooseberries, 
uh, red, black and white currants, honeyberry, blueberry, raspberries, lots of those, and several others, as well as apples. But I did make a significant mistake in the placement of this area because I chose the windiest location on my land. We're high up here and to the north there's an open cow field. And that means every year that much of the tree blossom on these cherry and some of the apple trees is blown off. And I underestimated the impact of wind on fruit and nut yielding trees. It is enormous. Most trees will tolerate some shade far better than they will tolerate wind. We do have a windbreak along the edge which I erected, but finally, after three years, my western red cedar hedge is beginning to reach a height in which it can offer some added protection for that tree blossom in the spring. Another problem in this area is how prolific the weed growth is between trees and bushes that aren't fully established yet. Currently I cut that and use it as a mulch, uh, as you can see, weeds suppressing themselves, which is quite cool. But next year I'm planning to introduce my chickens in here, before and then again after the trees and bushes go to flower and fruit, to try and keep that explosive weed growth to a minimum. Another example there of connecting those dots, because that means I get to turn this into eggs. Principle five, use and value renewables. I introduced solar panels just off camera now in my second year here at Mossy Bottom, but Ireland has an even better resource when it comes to renewable energy, and that's wind power. There are wind farms everywhere here because it's a very, very windy island. It's one of the things that makes filming so hard. But that's something that I want to take advantage of. So when my cottage is complete, I'm planning to introduce at least one wind turbine as my primary energy source. Using and valuing renewables doesn't just preserve finite resources like oil and natural gas, it also saves you money. We've all seen the rapid rise in fuel prices of late and been affected by it, and that's only set to continue. So investing in that infrastructure, which I have to say, having done some research, is an awful lot cheaper than it used to be, could be in your personal interest as well as that of the planet. Principle six, produce no waste. And I suspect when you hear this one, you probably think recycling. And of course, I recycle as much as I can here at Mossy Bottom, as I'm sure you do. It's difficult being in a remote location, much easier and more facilities uh, in a city. But there's another less obvious but very powerful way to produce less waste, and that's to produce more of the things that you and your family need and would otherwise buy. If you can grow and raise your own food, then you are drastically reducing the plastic used in processing and packaging food in supermarkets, as well as the food miles and oil cost to get that produce from farm to store to home. And you might be surprised how little produce in a supermarket is actually local. Most of it is driven across the country or continent even in huge, often refrigerated lorries. So if you can grow just 20% of what you eat, that will have an enormous impact on the pile of waste that each of us produces during our lifetime. Don't pay for things to be removed, which you can process yourself. The obvious example is green waste. Create a simple compost heap. Mix those leaves and grass cuttings in layers with torn up cardboard from cereal packets and Amazon boxes, and we all have those, let's admit it. And in a year, you'll have a ready-made compost for whatever your passion is in the garden, be it vegetables, ornamentals, flowers, even just using as a nutrient-rich mulch around trees. It doesn't have to be hard work. My example for Produce No Waste is these five litre water bottles, which I've used for years as mini greenhouses for seedlings. And they featured on the channel quite a few times. You can see here, I'm using them to grow uh, sweet pepper seedlings before I plant them out. And then of course, there's these 1000 litre IBC tanks, which at this stage, I really couldn't live without. All of which were recycled, I have about five on my land, cleaned, my God, that involved a lot of scrubbing, and uh, repurposed. Producing zero waste is very difficult, but reducing your waste definitely is not. Principle seven, design from patterns to details. 
And this is definitely my favorite permaculture principle because it's the one which tells you to connect those dots. And that's the thing which for me really makes permaculture special. I've already given you one example with my elder hedge, which produces food, fuel, and compost, whilst also functioning as a windbreak. But here's another. This area last year was my brassica crop. There were Brussels sprouts, uh, purple broccoli, kale, different species of cabbage, swede, kohlrabi, and a few other things, all planted in this area. And when the summer of 2021 ended, I left that crop right where it was through the autumn, winter, and following spring. In November and December, I was harvesting sprouts. In January and February, winter cabbage. In March and April, purple broccoli. And all the while, everything here was growing, including the weeds between those rows, which I didn't cut or discourage. In May, all those mature brassicas went to flower, producing an enormous amount of food for pollinators, like bees. And this area was like a rock concert for insects. It was so alive with the sound of tiny wings. Um, I think I posted to Instagram a picture or two. It was unbelievable, such a sight. But when those flowers went to seed, as they did in June, they became food for my chickens, and I've been harvesting them for that purpose every few days for a month now. Seeds, of course, are a great source of protein, which the chickens love and turn into yet more eggs, which I love and don't then have to spend money on to buy. But now in early July, I need to do something urgently with this area, otherwise all these weeds are going to go to seed. And yes, the grass already has gone to seed, but that's okay because grass can't really outcompete vegetables. But many of these weeds, uh, thistle, dock, nettles, hogweed, and this willow herb, which is prolific on my land and in flower right now, definitely can. And I don't want these seeds being dumped on this area and the surrounding areas carried by the wind, because if that happens, there's nothing I can do to get them out of the soil. So the next year, they will of course grow. What's the solution? Well, I could cut all this down and add it to the compost, but a much better solution is to turn it into food for these lovelies, my pigs. All I have to do is set up the electric fence, move them in and sit back and watch for the next few months while they eat everything down and then, even better, turn the soil hunting for roots. And then in around September or October, I can take the pigs out, add a compost mulch to the surface of the bare soil, cover it with membrane and let the worms and bacteria do the work over the autumn and winter, giving me the following spring bare soil enriched with compost and pig poop, of course, that's already been loosened by hungry snouts. Of course, some seeds will have got through, uh, after all, I have wild borders here and seeds blow in, then of course there's all the grass seed, but that's okay. In fact, as long as it doesn't outcompete my vegetables, which I'll plant out as mature or semi-mature seedlings, it's just another resource. Do you see all the dots, folks, and all the many connections that you can make between them? That creates a holistic system, and that's what nature is too, a holistic system. The difference is permaculture challenges you to create that through design. Principle eight, integrate, don't segregate. And this principle applies to people and communities too. Shared knowledge and resources is a much more powerful thing than going it alone. For me, volunteers play a huge part in the success of Mossy Bottom, my small holding. And it's definitely a mutual relationship. They offer labor and time, I offer an opportunity to try new things and learn new skills. And of course, I invested in that. I created this cabin for them to stay in. Community too is important. Someone like uh, Kyle, who I interviewed earlier this year, uh, living in his cottage in the wilds with no car, is a great example of how uh, embracing community can make the seemingly impossible a reality. My example for integrate, don't segregate is of course, companion planting, which you can see over here. Companion planting is just taking two or more crops, usually annuals, and planting them together in the same space to get an overall higher yield when combining those two. And usually it's done with species that benefit each other in some way. 
For instance, peas, which fix nitrogen in the soil, with brassicas, which require a high amount of nitrogen. And there are many different combinations which work. Just do a quick search on Google and you'll see that. But you have to understand your climate and the needs of those plants to get it right. One of the most well-known combinations is corn and squash, very popular in North America, I believe. But where I live, it's just too cool in the summer for either to ripen outside without a dedicated bed. And you can see my dedicated uh, corn bed behind me here. I've tried multiple times combining corn with squash in different ways. And instead of the 120% of corn and squash combined, I get 0% because by the time they start ripening in September, mold sets in because the wet weather comes. But there are many combinations which work well here. Chives and beets, I use that along border beds to deter slugs. They're not big fans of chives or beets either, to be honest. Parsley and asparagus uh, make use of periods when one plant is growing to harvest another. Just like in a meadow, first the dandelions appear, then the daisies, then the meadow sweet, and so on. If you can plant crops in the same way, then you can get multiple harvests from the same piece of land. This year I even planted carrots under my peach tree, and they're doing really well. Principle 9. Use small, slow solutions. I've already talked about moving slowly, but I think the concept of permaculture can be overwhelming for many people. It sounds like a huge amount of knowledge and research and expertise is required before you can even begin planting anything. But that's not true. Remember, nature doesn't have a grand plan. It just tries things and what works sticks. Permaculture says, do the same. Try things, be open and see what sticks. Since moving to Ireland, I've completed a two-year horticulture course because it's become a passion. But before moving here, all I had was my experience volunteering overseas and helping my granddad plant a few carrots and potatoes growing up. Most of what I know, quite honestly, I've learnt through trial and error right here. And anyone can do that, on a much grander or even smaller scale than this. A few of you asked about my mushroom logs. Uh, inoculated last spring with spores, well, unfortunately, they haven't worked. Not one mushroom has grown. The reason, I suspect, is that the beeswax candles I purchased uh, to plug the holes in these logs were in fact only 20% beeswax, which I didn't know at the time. It was a case of uh, wrong advertising, I think. But it was just a day's work, and now I know what to do differently next time. Cheese wax, I think. And when I harvest that first mushroom, it will be even more satisfying for the journey that I've gone on to get there. Principle 10. Use and value diversity. Have you ever wondered why nature, if left alone, is so diverse? Yes, it's beautiful, and we all appreciate that, but why isn't there one dominant tree, or one dominant mammal, or bird, or insect, which has just out-evolved uh, all the others? The answer is that dominance creates vulnerability. It comes right back to those locusts in video one. And there are so many other examples of how species that become dominant ultimately pay the price. Diversity, on the other hand, protects species. It creates strength. And that's why nature doesn't do monoculture. Every niche is occupied. Every scent falling from the sky is captured and utilized. Diversity is highly efficient and resilient. It protects against disease. Too much of one thing creates enormous vulnerability. In a permaculture garden, that means practicing crop rotation of annuals every year. Otherwise, carrots grown in the same place get carrot fly, brassicas get club root, potatoes get blight, and so on. How do plants avoid that in nature? Well, they produce seeds and they disseminate. They move every year. And they have life cycles. Perennials and trees die and then are reborn somewhere else from their seedlings, creating glades for the seeds from those annuals and ephemerals to spring forth into. My example for use and value diversity is this, the bee garden, which I created last year from what was a trash heap. Literally, the previous owner's household waste had been dumped here in a mountain uh, for the last 50 years. Currently going through its borage and mallow phase. 
And this area is all about encouraging pollinators, as well as predatory insects and birds. I also have log piles dotted around in different parts of my land and wild borders, of course, everywhere with native species. When it comes to protecting against pests and diseases, diversity really matters. Principle 11, you knew we'd make it in here at some point, <laughs> value the marginal. And this principle always makes me reflect on the difference between farming and gardening. A one acre field can in theory produce enough food to sustain 10 people, but only I suspect if managed by a gardener, not a farmer. Because gardening asks the question, how much food can I produce from this piece of land? Farming asks, how much of this particular species can I grow on this piece of land? A gardener sees a shady area under a tree as an opportunity to plant shade-loving species, like uh, carrots, for instance, or nettles for nitrogen, or even to situate mushroom logs. A farmer sees that shady area as somewhere wasted in which his main crop, like wheat, will not grow. What does he do? Well, he cuts down the tree, or just produces less of his crop. There are species which fill every niche. Nature has provided us with that. But you have to see opportunities, not obstacles. My example of value the marginal is this, the pathways between my vegetable rows. And remember, I said that I don't mind too much if the uh, grass goes to seed. Well, that's because the more grass I can produce, the more animal feed and green matter for my compost during the growing season. It's a resource. And if I cover these areas up with um, wood chips, for instance, as many growers do, then I lose that resource. Principle 12, creatively use and respond to change. Permaculture is not dogmatic. It asks you to look around, understand nature and the environment you're in, and then adapt to it creatively. And the example on my homestead, there are many, but this one is my strawberry beds. And although they began their life as simple flatbeds, in the second year, I realized that being on high ground as they are, they were drying out too much during the fruiting season. So I created hoogle mounds. And uh, in a hoogle mound, you dig a trench, you fill it with decaying branches, lots of them, um, which I just gathered from my hedgerows. There's no shortage of them. And then you cover back up with the soil. Those branches hold moisture and nutrients which are released slowly over a period of many years to anything growing above. You don't need to water or add fertilizer. But with abundant harvests of strawberries, as I had, came pests. So I introduced ducks to control the slugs out of season, which produced more eggs for me, of course, and cats to reduce the mouse population. And that helped, definitely, but the best thing I ever started doing was harvesting strawberries as soon as they showed a hint of red, allowing them to finish ripening indoors, away from those pests. Of course, the slugs and mice still get plenty of my strawberries, but now, well, it's maybe 20 or 30% instead of 60 or 70%. And the strawberries I harvest that have been nobbled or damaged, well, you guessed it, they become food for my livestock. There's no waste. It's also worth noting that almost everything I grow here thrives in this particular climate and location. And I always choose varieties and species most closely adapted to the area that I live. Like this, which is British basil. Or the autumn king carrots that I have growing uh, under my peach tree. And that's because I want a high yield, not a rosette for the largest pumpkin or sweetest tomato. Permaculture is about growing food to feed people, not winning prizes at village fairs. Okay, everyone, that is just about it for this, the second video in my permaculture series. Stay tuned for the third in the coming weeks in which I'll be taking on, amongst other things, the weeds and asking the question, does permaculture offer a secret to better managing them? And honestly, the answer probably won't be what you're expecting. I hope you're enjoying this series. Please remember to like this video and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. It definitely helps me. And if you want to support my creative endeavors here in the west of Ireland, then consider joining me on Patreon. You'll find more information at mossybottom.com.
www.ghostbusiness.ie. For now though, from me to you, wherever you are in the world, take care and bye for now. home to call our own will work as another day home